Thank you. I'm glad to be here and to be able to share with you some things that I hope will be very helpful to you as you're working on tenure. And if you're already tenured, the things I'm talking about are going to be very helpful anyhow. I'll talk more specifically about some, specific, some things having to do with tenure in the last part of the program, but I think the general things that you need to get tenure are the very same things you need to be successful thereafter. And hopefully you aren't planning on getting tenure and then retiring on the job, okay? As once in a while happens, uh, I should correct one thing Dave said. I was not a department head for 24 years at Texas A&M. I would be brain dead by now if I had had that job. So uh, people who really don't aspire to be lifetime administrators normally don't do this over four to six years. And the reason is if you stay out of your own research uh, work for that length of time, then you can't go back. And so when the dean asked me to be a candidate and then eventually offered me the job, he made me promise to stay at least four years. Um, and I told him I promised not to do a day longer than that. And after three years, I contacted him and said, just what I thought, I really am going to quit at the end of four years. We don't want an interim, so please get a search started and let's have a replacement. But the four years that I spent as department head, I thought were terrific learning experiences for me. Uh, it was a great opportunity to grow in some ways I wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, one of the things that I had the distinction of being department head in a time period where we were with terrible financial constraints. This was 1989 to 1993. Now, for those of you who remember the economic ups and downs of the country, there was a big recession in that time period. Uh, we had two bienniums of our legislature meeting, and in both of them we got our budgets cut. So I had the privilege of inheriting a department that had been bankrupted by the preceding department head because he didn't understand the budget very well. Uh, and then on top of that, I got my budget cut the next uh, uh, two-year time cycles. And so we had the, and during that time period, our department grew from having about 800 students to 1,200 undergraduate students. So we have lots more work and less money to get it done. And I thought, this is really uh, going to be a terrible time to be a department head. Uh, but at the same time, I read a book that really got me to thinking, and it was written by uh, Stephen Covey, it had just come out, it's called Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. You may have heard of this book. It has the distinction of being the longest running book on the New York Times bestseller list in history, and it was never, ever publicized. They never advertised it. It was all word of mouth. But it was on for nine years, translated into about 50 languages. It was uh, uh, ideas that d were derived from a workshop that they had developed for training people in industry. And over 350 of the Fortune 500 companies actually had this sort of training. Either they sent their employees to a uh, three-day workshop that uh, uh, Stephen Covey had on seven habits of highly effective people, or else later they began to let companies uh, uh, have their own trainers and do the programs in-house so they didn't have to spend all of the money on travel and hotel and, and so forth. And so when I heard that they had that, uh, I actually had some vice presidents of Exxon and Shell who are on my advisory board for our department who highly recommended it because their companies were doing it. And so I went and took the training, and then I said, gosh, we can't afford to send people to programs like this for $1,500 plus travel and, and hotel. I said, can I do the facilitator training and do it for my own department uh, faculty? And they said, sure. So we were the first university to ever sign up. To do this, initially they made the license for my department, but they said, would you like to make it for the whole university? And I said, is it the same price, $10,000? And they said, yeah, it's the same price. I said, it's okay, good. I'll do this and then charge other departments to come. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. <laughs> I thought if it's 10 grand for us and it's 10 grand for everybody, then let's do it for everybody. So that's basically how I got interested in this and had a terrific opportunity to work with my own faculty because we had to learn how to do more and more with less and less. And I'm not talking about just the faculty working on tenure. I'm talking about everybody from top, top to bottom and to do it without going crazy. And so uh, by word of mouth, though, a lot of people outside my department began to hear about what my faculty were learning and how they were feeling like it was benefiting them. And so they began to tell their friends. And lots of people wanted to come. And by word of mouth, we I ended up teaching it for 10 years every semester, uh, one and a half hours on Tuesdays for the whole semester because it's about three days' worth of lecture time if you, if you add it up. And uh, uh, by the, the next semester, we'd already have a full group of people waiting to take it, and it was a great opportunity to help a lot of people in the university uh, over time. Uh, so what I'm going to be sharing with you today is really the highlights of a program that properly done takes 
24 hours. So if you think, gosh, there must be more to this story than we're getting, the answer is there is. And if you find what we talk about today is interesting, then I would highly encourage you to go to Stephen Covey and Franklin have combined to be Franklin Covey today. There's lots of terrific uh, materials that they have, books, planners, a lot of things that are tools that can really, really uh, help you. One of the things I would most recommend for, the, for professors is there is a book entitled First Things First that I would highly recommend to you. There is a, uh, the first book that was written was Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, but the problem with this book is it's a great book. It presents the theory beautifully. It does not sort of give you the steps to implement. First Things First was written as a second book to say, okay, if you really think this is a great idea, here's how to do it. And so one is very kind of hands-on applications. The other is more kind of paint the big picture uh, of what we ought to be doing. And so those would be the, the two resources. There are other resources as well uh, and planners and lots of things that, uh, that I would recommend. Their paper planners are terrific and I still use one today. Uh, their software is horrible and I don't recommend it at all. I don't know why they can do paper planners really well and then you buy their software and you think, gosh, every other software I use is better than this and this is a big, big company and they're in the business of helping people be more efficient and then you use their software and you go, this is a nightmare. Where did they get this, you know? So, <clears throat> but it'll be, I think, terrific stuff and you'll like it a lot. Now, what we're going to do, let me switch back to the computer here if I can make it come on. Okay, let me, okay, you got that? Okay, good, we're doing it backwards, there we go. Okay, so here's what we're going to do today. We're going to overview the seven habits of highly effective professors. And how is this different than seven habits of highly effective people? All of the examples and illustrations are going to be professor type examples and illustrations. So the principles are the same for everybody, but the particulars are, depends on what your profession is, what your kind of uh, role uh, in life is, what are you doing in this stage of things. And so the details may change, the principles do not. But we'll overview the whole thing. Now, the ones that are, I think, most important for our purposes today are going to be habits two, three, and four, and five. And I'll go over those in some greater detail, and we'll talk very specifically about applications that I think will help you uh, as you're working on tenure, or if you're already past that process, then uh, uh, as you're trying to enjoy being a, a professor as a career uh, without always being stressed out, with always be feeling like your life is out of control, uh, and you uh, sort of like learning to juggle. I think being a professor has the problem that you have to multitask, right? When you're a graduate student, particularly when you're working on your dissertation, you only had to do one thing, and you could focus on that. Now that you get to uh, uh, be a professor, you have to do multiple things, and the idea is you're supposed to do them all well, but they're very different. Some have lots of short-term goals. The others have long-term goals and how you kind of combine these and, and stay balanced, plus have a real life at home is very, very challenging. Some years ago, maybe 15 years ago, somebody did a study to determine how uh, working on tenure affected people's personal life and the statistics on the percentage of people that actually get divorced going through the tenure process is, is surprisingly high. The number I remember, but I hope it's not true today, was 30%. Why that high number though, whatever it is, it's not insignificant, is it's, you can't put the rest of your life on hold for five years because you're working on tenure. You can't let your children, if you have children, be neglected for five years. You can't neglect your marriage for five years, and yet there's so much pressure to do the things you need to do because there's so much at stake. And so hopefully what we're going to be talking about today will help you not only be successful in working uh, toward tenure, but doing that in a way that does not jeopardize the other important areas uh, of your life. It's not worth it to get tenure and lose your marriage. It's not worth it to get tenure and have your kids all end up in the ditch, so to speak, okay? You don't want to have to do that, and hopefully you don't have to choose if you do it right. Okay, then we're going to talk about building a successful career in research. Obviously, in today's research university, which OSU is and Texas A&M uh, is, uh, uh, many other universities, to be successful, you have to be a good teacher, but if you're going to be at a research university, you also have to be able to be successful in doing research. And I want to give you some, what I hope will be very helpful, uh, suggestions on how to do that. Uh, during the years that I was department head, I was quite surprised 
to note, I had 67 faculty in my department. Uh, I did very careful annual reviews for all of these people every year, uh, taking all of the data from the department, uh, carefully uh, preparing, and then reviewing with them for an hour and a half apiece on how they were doing. It was the single most important thing that I did uh, for my faculty, to try to give them a realistic picture of how they're doing. Um, what I noted along the way, though, is that I had some faculty that worked really hard, but they, didn't they were not necessarily the most productive. I had some faculty that were obviously very smart, and they also didn't necessarily do very well. And you would think working hard and being smart were the two single most important things. But as we go through the program today, I'm going to try to show you it's actually quite possible to be very smart and to be, work very hard and still not be successful. And uh, what we want to do is to be able to help you to see how to take the uh, gifts and talents that you have and the energy and the determination you have and channel that in such a way that you're as absolutely productive as you can possibly be. And hopefully that'll be good enough, okay? So that's what we want to do. And then at the end, I'm going to talk about some particular things for those of you working on tenure or for those of you who are associate professors maybe working on full, uh, toward full professor or if you're full professor working for, uh, I just was told that uh, your school has 100 new chair professors positions and so those are often used to recruit outstanding out external people, uh, but when uh, we assign chairs in our own department, we let our own faculty compete for those because if they're better than the people we could bring in, then it would be unfair to not let them do that. And so uh, for professors, there's always one more uh, golden apple right along the way. It seems like you never run out of those and uh, something else to reach for. Okay, so that's where we're headed. And we will, I'll provide the PowerPoints for you, but I didn't do that ahead of time. Uh, not on purpose, just because I wasn't practicing some of what I'm going to be preaching today. I didn't get it done earlier, and, uh, uh, but I'll be glad to, to make that available through, through email. Uh, if you sign up on the list, uh, that's, are we going to circulate that? Or? Okay, good. Okay, so any questions about where we're going, what we're going to be doing? And I promise we'll quit at 5 o'clock no matter where we are, okay? I know how it is, and most of you are on tight time schedules. Some of you have to pick up kids or do other things or go to uh, kids' sporting events or uh, so forth. And so we shall quit on time no matter what. Okay, let me do, uh, well, I'm trying to decide how to do this. Where did my pen go? Okay, Covey has a sort of a nifty way. better? Is it coming up? Yeah, let me do this, I think. Oops, sorry. There we go. Okay. I'm going to be in the dark for just a minute, okay, to try to outline some things. Here's the overview using the very clever geometric design that Covey has. We all start out as being dependent, and then as we pass through life and as we raise our children, we hope we go from being dependent to what? Uh, sorry independent, and then later if we really become uh, successful, we learn how to be appropriately interdependent. Now, Covey calls the transition from being dependent to independent as the private victory. And it really has to do with self-mastery. It has to do with the fact that I really need to learn to manage my life in such a way that I can uh, truly take care of all the things I'm supposed to do and do it in a very careful and responsible way. The going from independent to the independent to interdependent is what he calls the public victory. Okay. 
And the public victory has to, to do with learning how to work effectively with other people. So independence has to do with my personal effectiveness. Interdependence has to do with my interpersonal effectiveness. Would you agree that both of these are important for faculty members? I think most people who are successful in research learn to be collaborators with other researchers who have similar interests but complementary backgrounds. In the area that I work in in engineering, people are usually more specialized in doing experimental work or in doing computer modeling. There almost isn't enough time to master both of these at a high level. So a person who does experimental work would naturally collaborate with somebody who uh, does more modeling. Uh, if you go to the National Science Foundation today and you write a proposal that has just modeling, they will not fund anything that's pure modeling. They want models to be confirmed or uh, determined to be not true with experimental results. And vice versa, you get a lot more mileage out of your experimental results if you can use the, the modeling then to be able to uh, predict many other similar kinds of things. So uh, I think being successful involves, first of all, becoming very personally effective and then becoming very interpersonally effective. Uh, when I noted people in my department when I did annual reviews, the ones who generally were doing better work were also the people who had learned how to work collaboratively with other people. It's very hard to work in your own little cubby hole and never interact with either people in your department or people in your field from other universities uh, and be as successful as you can be. So our habits two and three we're going to talk about today are going to deal with personal effectiveness. Habits four and five deal with interpersonal effectiveness. And both of these are extremely important <coughs> habits to be developed. Okay, so uh, what kinds of things do we need to do? Let's do habits one, two, and three, deal with personal effectiveness, habits four, five, and six, deal with interpersonal effectiveness. Habit one is called be proactive. Okay. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that because we just have too many things to do today, so I'm just going to sort of put it there. The second habit, okay, uh, is called begin with the end in mind. The third habit has to do with what we're going to call first things first. Now, as we talk about these habits, it's interesting to know that when Covey first took his book for publication in his manuscript form, the first two publishers <coughs> who reviewed it said, there's nothing new here. This is just common sense. And as I go through these, I'm going to try to persuade you it is just common sense, but it is not common practice. And part of the reason that Covey's uh, uh, books have become so successful is that it's the sort of thing that when you hear about it you'll say well of course that makes sense everybody should do that the problem is the habits we're talking about are habits that very few people actually have it's one that are, that are easy to understand but not necessarily easy to develop into reliable habits okay so the uh, private victory as opposed to the public victory is going to involve becoming more proactive beginning with the end in mind, and first things first, and I'll elaborate on what those mean uh, in just a minute. Okay, habit four is going to be think, win, win. Habit five is going to be seek first to understand. And then to be understood. And then habit six is going to be synergize. And then there's a seventh habit that sort of encompasses all of these, which is called sharpen the saw. Anybody have any idea of what in the world he's talking about to adult, professional people, including faculty, by sharpen the saw? He has a great illustration in uh, his uh, 
programs uh, that uh, we taught at, at uh, A&M. They actually have videos with him speaking and then a facilitator, which is what I was. I'm not Stephen Covey. He's, I don't do, give his talks. He gives great talks I couldn't give. But then we do the facilitation and sort of help people do applications. But in this program, he shows uh, uh, two woodsmen that go out to chop wood, and at the beginning uh, of their chopping, they chop for about 50 minutes, and one of them stops and takes a 10-minute break, and the other one, trying to be diligent, continues to chop wood. Okay? At the end of the next hour, the first woodsman again takes a 10-minute break, and the second one thinks this guy's really lazy, uh, taking all these breaks, and so he uh, uh, continues to uh, chop wood without taking a break, and so it goes through the end of the day, and by the end of the day, he has a rather poor opinion of this guy who took all the breaks, but when they turn in their wood, it turns out that the guy who took all the breaks chopped twice as much wood. And now he's really, really upset, and he says, well, gosh, how did a guy like you, lazy goof off taking all these breaks, chop twice as much wood as me? And he said, well, if you'd pay better attention, when I was taking my break, I was sharpening my ax. Okay? Now, what does that have to do with uh, uh, professors, with professional people, with college students? What, what do you think that, what's the application of that? It has to do with things like how many hours of sleep do you get per night? How much exercise do you get? How do you eat? Uh, and you may think you can get by on five hours of sleep a night and you may survive, but you will not thrive. Same thing with our students, right? They've actually done tests that show when you don't get the proper amount of sleep that your functional IQ goes down by about 20% or more depending on how much sleep you don't get. What's the benefit of getting exercise intellectually? You think there's any intellectual benefit of exercise? Okay, what is it? How, how does exercising make you smarter? It is absolutely right. When you exercise, you get the oxygen level in your blood up much higher, and then it exponentially decays over about 24 hours. But when you have that oxygenation, you are much more mentally alert. So if you never exercise, that means your oxygen level is at some minimalist level, and you are not nearly as smart as you might be. So when I combine those together and say, well, I'm too busy working on tenure, I've just suspended exercise for the next five years, and I'm going to try to get by on six hours of sleep a night because I'm working towards tenure, then what you'll find is, well, you're probably 20 or 30 percent less smart than you might be, and you would have been much better off if you'd sharpened your ax and worked a little bit less time, right? So one of the things I would like to encourage you as we get into some of these details is to say one of the goals is going to be to say I'm going to balance my life in such a way that I do all the things that are essential to have a healthy, balanced life, which will, in fact, then contribute to my working toward uh, the goals of tenure in a way that has the best possible uh, opportunity to see that be successful. If you think you can be a Spartan for five years and not nurture your social life, your uh, physical life, uh, your physical health, uh, your spiritual life, you think you can do that, just put it on hold for five years, it's a really bad gamble and probably will prove to to cause you to be less successful than if you were sharpening your axe, keeping it really sharp, and getting more stuff done. Now, there's another interesting thing. Psychologists uh, have determined that all of the transfer of information from your brain, from your short-term memory to your long-term memory, takes place when? We got any psychology, psych psychology people in here? No? Okay. I'm told it happens with when you have rapid eye movement sleep, which is between the sixth and the eighth hour. And I always challenge my students, they say, boy, I get to the test and I can't remember anything. Well, that probably means you're just sleeping six hours a night. So there's no transfer, and you're having to learn it over and over and over again. It doesn't stick, right? It's like throwing it against the wall and keeps falling off. Throw it against the wall, it keeps falling off. Guess what? That doesn't just apply to students. It applies to adults. And I'm persuaded as I get older and my memory gets worse that probably... Uh, it's even more challenging if I'm not getting the proper amount of sleep. Okay, so let me begin by saying one of the most important things for you to do if you plan to be a successful candidate and to earn your tenure 
uh, is to say, take care of yourself, right? There's the old adage of the goose that lays the golden eggs. You've probably heard this before. It's an old Aesop's fable. Uh, and in the Aesop's fable, this farmer has a goose that, as he's collecting the eggs one day, finds this one goose laid a golden egg, and he can't believe it. It's heavy. It looks like gold. He goes and has the assay. Oh, my gosh, it really is gold. He's ecstatic. Next day, he goes back, and the goose lays another golden egg, same goose. And it happens five days in a row. He is so excited he cannot stand it. He takes the goose, cuts its throat, slits it open, and guess what? No golden eggs. Crud. He just did what? Kill the goose who laid the golden eggs. Now, in your life, you're the goose, and you want to take good care of the goose so the goose will continue to be able to uh, uh, lay golden eggs. Okay, so let's get back to our PowerPoint. And Okay, let's begin with habit two. Habit two is uh, called begin with the end in mind. It's the habit of personal vision. If you're working on tenure, one of the most obvious things that you need to do is to think about what are the necessary things for you to do to earn tenure. In Covey's presentation of this, it's not designed just for professors, and it's really not just designed for you to, to earn tenure. It really is a good principle of life to say, what is my mission, okay, and what is my vision? If you're taking notes, you might begin with the end in mind. Uh, uh, here, uh, we're talking now about the uh, beginning with the end in mind in terms of what would it look like five years down the road, and uh, I should have on the PowerPoint called that, what is your vision? Your mission is what's your purpose for life? What things do you value? What kind of character do you want to develop? Who do you want to become? because we're all in the process of becoming somebody. And obviously, working toward tenure is a part of that. Some of you want to become a tenured professor. But you also want to become a person who has better health, who has wider intellectual interest, who has maybe a, a more uh, robust uh, circle of friends. I mean, there's a lot of things that we want, right? And uh, I think that the point that Covey makes is if you have small dreams, or if your vision for your life is very narrow, then your life at the end of the day is going to also reflect that. If I have a bigger, grander vision for my life, that not, not to say all my dreams will come true in spite of what they say at Disney World. Uh, you can dream upon a star, and it doesn't mean all the things you dream happen, but trust me, the things you don't dream will never happen. And so the idea here is to sort of begin with the end in mind to develop a grand vision for your life that includes your professional goals, but not just those, okay? Once you've given some careful thought to this, and this is where the 24-hour program actually provides some good guidance and instruction on how to do this, but I think a lot of this is available at Covey's website. Uh, then the next thing you want to do is to develop what I think of as a vision, and the vision is going to look like this, okay? Where do I want to be five years from now, and what do I want to be doing? Now, and if you're working on tenure, uh, where you want to be is not necessarily a place, it's a place in accomplishing the things you need to to be able to earn tenure. Some of you have already been here for several years, and so that time window may be shorter. But if I can define very specifically, not just in the broad areas of my life, but in the specific things that my department's going to require for me to earn tenure, then I can subdivide that and say, if I'm going to make that journey in five years, how far down the road do I need to be at the end of my first year? Because there is a tendency in all of us to procrastinate. Would you agree? I think procrastination is something that must be in our genes because I think everybody naturally procrastinates unless you develop some strategies to overcome that. We all tend to do that. And somehow I think faculty do it even more than other people. We always chastise our students for procrastinating and then we, I'm worried that they're watching me too closely and they're sort of modeling uh, some of my natural inclinations to procrastinate. If I decide where I want to be at the end of this year, if I'm making this journey, if you think of it as a journey of 2,000 miles and I'm going to go uh, 500, uh, uh, say a five-day journey of 2,000 miles and I need to do 400 miles a day, I get my map out, I carefully see, okay, where am I going to be at the end of the first day, where do I need to be at the end of the second day, uh, third day, and so forth. You can actually easily do that in terms of your tenure work 
And I think one of the things that we tend to do is we don't tend to sit down and think through this very carefully and get it all worked out. There's an old uh, English uh, uh, saying that is, we don't plan to fail, we just fail to plan. Okay? And if you don't develop the habit of carefully planning in the different important things that you want to see happen in your life, then most of those things will almost surely not come to pass. Okay, so <clears throat> I figure out where do I need to be at the end of this year. I might, in my case, I normally broke this down not by years but by semesters. I said, okay, before the semester begins, here's what I absolutely am going to commit myself to doing, no matter what. Okay, come hell or high water, I'm going to get this amount done. I don't want to sort of wait and have all the pressure my last year trying to make up for the lack of pressure I applied to myself early on. So I think the key thing is if I have some very specific goals for the year or for the semester, then I can actually break those down into what do I need to be doing the first week of school? What do I need to be, where do I need to be at the end of the first week if I'm going to accomplish to here? Then what's the first week? How about the second week, the third week, the fourth week? And if I carefully lay that out, what I may conclude is, uh-oh, the plans I have aren't realistic because I don't think I can get that much done. But suppose I do that. I make my plans for the week. I decide exactly how much time each of those particular uh, goals for the week are going to take. Uh, and then I'm going to put that into a weekly schedule. And we'll talk more about this in just a second. How many of you carefully schedule your time on Sunday nights so that your whole week is carefully laid out and you're going to be sure and get the right things done? How many? One. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about is going to be a shift from the way most people actually do their business or don't do their business. Again, if you don't plan, if you, we don't plan to fail, we just fail to plan. And one of the most sure ways to fail is to not carefully plan. Now, I think it's much harder today than it was when I was working for tenure. I uh, got my PhD in 1965 at the age of 24, and I didn't have 500 TV channels. I didn't have an iPhone. I didn't have the huge amount of what I think of as uh, communi communication and information overload. So I didn't have near as many distractions. And I actually think today in some ways all these, some of these things are helpful, but in some ways they really are distractions and it's easy to fritter away huge amounts of time unless you learn to become very, very focused. And I think there's no way to do that except to get into becoming very careful at planning. I like to think of my planning for the week as the compass to help me not get lost. Have you ever had weeks where you had all these great, grandiose ideas of what you're going to do this week, and then you get to Friday and you go, crud, I didn't get hardly anything that I really needed to get done, done. Have you had weeks like that? Yeah. If you don't have a compass, then the storms of the week are almost surely going to blow you way, way off track. Okay. From where you should be. Okay, so the, the, the bottom line here is, and first things first, when we're talking about uh, this second principle, the sort of actualization of this has to happen after I've carefully made a bigger plan that I've reduced to what I must be doing week by week, and then commit myself to doing careful planning on Sunday for what's coming for the next week. Another time that's not a bad time to do this is Friday afternoon before you go home. And the reason is on Friday afternoon you're very mindful of the things that, you, that were really important that you didn't quite get done or the things that are coming next week you know are going to be due. And it is uh, even better if you, sometimes I have trouble planning on Friday afternoon though because I'm really, really tired. And when it's really hard to be enthusiastic about making big plans for next week when you're going, oh, I can barely get home. But I think if you can do it no later than when you go to bed on, on uh, Sunday evening, then when you get up on Monday morning, you already have your marching orders. You know exactly what you're going to do, and hopefully you'll be much better at uh, uh, following that plan and doing the things that you need to get done. Now, Cuppy has a rather simple scheme here 
uh, that helps us to think through how we spend our time. I don't know if this was original with him, but I haven't seen it anyplace else. But if I were going to uh, define every possible activity I can be involved in, uh, I have two criteria I'm going to look at. How important is it? Okay, now you can do this more. I've seen people do it with more squares, but I don't think you need more squares. Let's just make it simple and say important are not important, or very important and not important, okay, however you want to do it. And then the other uh, dimension on the uh, diagram is urgent and not urgent, okay? So everything I do can be, can be classified as one of those four. Now, quadrant one is the quadrant of doing things that are what? Important and urgent. Quadrant two is the quadrant of doing things that are really important, but not, and I would put not yet urgent, because all of these things become urgent at some point, don't they? <laughs> you just aren't to the deadline yet. Quadrant three is the things that are urgent, are uh, not important and urgent. What's an example of something that's urgent but not important? For me, it used to be telephone. Every time the telephone rings, we tend to do what? Answer it. And we can break our day into lots of little pieces uh, because I'm doing what? And it used to be the phone calls I got, maybe 20% of them were really important and about 80% of them weren't that important, but you don't know until you answer. Once you've answered, you're on the hook. Now, what's today's version of the telephone interruption? Email. Email is a big nemeth. I get 100 emails a day. And I guarantee you there are at least uh, 90 of them that probably are not important. I have to kind of fish through to try to get the 10 that are. But it's easy to fritter away lots of time, is it not? By doing things that uh, are things that come to you uh, that you feel obliged to respond to. When I was first department head, I was trying to be, I had an open door policy so people could come by. I was going to be a really good uh, department head and sort of have everybody come by whenever they wanted to. And between having the phone ring, having about that much mail every day, having faculty come in, after about two months I realized I'm not really doing any useful work. I'm just responding, I'm reacting to my environment. And in a sense when you're responding to telephone calls and email and snail mail and people knocking on your door, you're being reactive, not proactive. Okay. Now, as a department head, I wasn't able to say, well, I'm just going to shut the door and never talk to anybody, although that was a sort of a temptation. I'm going to take all the mail and just throw it away. <clears throat> but I had to develop some coping schemes because I was spending a lot of money doing things that at the end of the day were not all that important, and it was preventing me from getting to do the things that were really important. I got so much mail as a department head, I, mean, I, had, I taught my admin to separate it into sort of uh, importance levels one, two, three, and four, and I really worked on one. I sometimes worked on two, and about every two weeks, I just threw away three and four. I decided, you know, I'm never going to get all this mail done. And the, they did not pay me at the end of my two years when I got my midterm review. If the dean had said, well, what did you do for the last two years? I answered the door, I answered the mail, I answered the phone, and I did a first-class job of just staying in touch with everybody. Yeah, but what did you really do? Well, I was busy. I was answering the phone, answering the mail, and today's world answering email. And I don't think there's any place on your tenure packet where it says something about the quality of your servicing of your email. But it's easy, isn't it? There's so many things that were just accosted. Does some of you do Twitter? See, I'm not a Twitter person. I think people who Twitter are tweets. And when I was in high school, being a tweet was not a term of endearment, okay? But uh, <coughs> I don't, if I'm, all my... Uh, students tweet and probably my kids tweet and my grandkids for sure tweet and so but it's just another way to do what? Sort of fritter away your time either to receive or to give okay I try to do either uh, I'm on I have a Facebook and I go check it at least once a month to see what's going on but for a while I didn't even have a picture on there and then some of my students figured out how to get into it and they put a picture of Mickey Mouse in on my Facebook, and I decided, well, I better go at least put my picture in there, replace Mickey Mouse. 
I think Facebook's a great way to stay in touch, but I have limited time for some of these things, and I guess the problem is how relatively important is that compared to other things? And is it my preferred way of staying in touch? And the answer is maybe not. I'd rather have sort of biological friends rather than electronic friends, and I can't stay in touch with, with everybody. But I think you get the point here. Okay, now, here is the problem. If you were going to be really successful as a professor, where would you spend the biggest amount of your time? Quadrant one. Does everybody agree? So you're going to do all the really important things up against deadlines at the last minute and do a credit job. Is that right? <laughs> Two. Now, you were answering probably with response to where you actually spend your time, not where you ideally should spend your time. Okay, so in Covey's scheme of things, he calls this, this is interesting, he calls this the quadrant of prevention. He calls it the quadrant of quality. This is really the quadrant of urgency, okay? But the goal would be to learn to do your important things before they become urgent, so you're not doing them poorly at the last minute. And I have some people that say, I just can't work until I'm under pressure, and they'll you know, I never did an all-nighter as an undergraduate. I never stayed up past midnight. Once I got to be a professor, I did all-nighters periodically. And I thought, I never thought I'd do an all-nighter. And then I found, man, when you got a $100,000 proposal on the line that's due tomorrow at NSF, too bad, you just don't get to sleep, you know. But why did I let myself get there? I mean, that's the basic point. When you're writing a paper that has a hard deadline, if you do it at the last minute, is it going to be as good as, it's going, as it could be? The answer is, of course not. You write it once, you edit it superficially, you send it off, and then when you get the reviews back, you go, gosh, that really wasn't very good. So my goal in life is to live in quadrant two. Now, it would be ideal if I could be there 100% of the time, but that would assume that I don't have any serendipity in my life, and it would also assume that I'm extraordinarily disciplined and I'm not extraordinarily disciplined. I just aspire to be more than I am. So let's look at the next slide and see uh, uh, what we might say about these things. Uh, quadrant one, we can call the quadrant of necessity. In a given week, when I'm trying to figure out and, put my, and plan my schedule, these are the things that absolutely are going to be at the top of the list because if I don't do them this week, it's right? Now, obviously, this has to do for sure with my teaching activities. And one of the challenges here is that teaching has lots of short-term deadlines. Research has very few deadlines, and they're mostly long-term, correct? That really puts attention because if I'm always responding to short-term deadlines, then I'm kicking the can down the road for those things that aren't due this week, but you can only kick it down the road so far. And then you run into real trouble. And then you end up doing the things that are really important under hard deadlines with insufficient time resources. And it ends up making a big mess out of things. So that's one of the challenges to balance because ideally research activities almost of necessity if they're going to be done well or they're long term, they aren't due this week, you're working on a research project or a paper or a book or whatever you happen to be doing, and it may be a project that has a two-year deadline. One of the nice things in graduate school was at least the last part of your graduate program, you mainly worked on your dissertation, correct? Uh, maybe you did some teaching, but in some cases not. I, I ended up uh, uh, having only, a, I did a little bit of teaching when I was doing my PhD, but not much. So my primary responsibility was to work on that dissertation. Now I'm juggling one ball. You know, you don't have to be a great juggler to juggle one ball. You can be very monolithic and very focused. But then you get into a teaching job and they say, oh, you're going to teach one course or so your first semester. But then they say, now you're not a neophyte anymore. You're going to do two and then maybe three. And then they're going to give you departmental service. And you've got all these other things. And maybe you're married and you have children. And, and life gets really complicated, and there are lots of things to juggle. And I think that question is, in the midst of all that juggling, how do I keep my priorities as they should be? Because the tendency is to do what? Just respond to the next emergency. 
So my agenda can be set by my environment. What pressured me right this minute is what I do. I'm not following my priorities. I'm simply responding to my emergencies. And as a result, I do all the wrong things. And the important things that aren't urgent get what? Kicked down the road. Man, this is the single biggest reason I think many people don't make tenure, is they never learn to do their important things before they become urgent. And that probably most of the things we do in research end up being uh, at least of that type. Now, it's quite possible, for example, to say I'm going to write a proposal this semester and I'm going to work on it all semester, and then I get busy with this and get busy with that and fritter away my time, and all of a sudden it is the last week of the semester, and now I got to get it done. My first semester teaching, my department head gave me only one thing I had to do, and that was to write an NSF proposal that they had a special category for new professors who'd been professors three years or less, kind of like some of the career awards today. And I managed to get swamped with all the other things I was doing as a new professor and all the distractions I had. And uh, we had uh, one baby that was six months old when I started and another one that was along the way that was born not very long after that, 13 months apart. And my life was just chaotic. And it dawned on me the week of Thanksgiving that I had not even started on this proposal. And he only gave me one thing to do. He said, I don't care whatever else you do. Work on your teaching. You've got to have that proposal. Now, the due date was December 1st. Okay? And I'm going, oh, my. But you know how you just sort of keep thinking these things. You'll get to it next week, and you'll get to it next week, and you'll get to it next week. And then I did something I've never done before since. I did a double all-nighter in a row. I went from Monday morning until Wednesday afternoon and wrote a proposal. Was it a great proposal? No, it wasn't that great. Uh, then, uh, in what was almost a miracle, uh, it got funded. April 1st, some people call me to say, oh, I heard, congratulations, your proposal got funded. I didn't even know. The congressmen get to announce these as if they were responsible, right? So it was in the Denver Post, and that's how I first found out, and then I heard from, from uh, NSF. When I went back and did the literature search, which I had not done carefully, I found all kinds of things that were wrong with that. It was amazing and really fortunate that I got that funded. But I didn't, that's not a good plan for how to get funded research, is to sort of do it in three days with no night, no sleep. And uh, so uh, you can't do quality work in that way. Okay, quadrant. Now, here's where I want to spend most of my time. Let me give you some other examples. Uh, what would you consider exercise as a quadrant? One, two, three, or four. What do you think? Two. two. Does everybody agree? Okay, so uh, could be one, but here's the thing. Everything that you don't do in two eventually becomes so let's say exercise. Say, well, I don't have time to exercise. I'm working on tenure. So five years down the road, I have heart trouble. I develop diabetes. I have all these problems. Why? Because I'm not taking care of myself. It's like your car. You say, I don't have time to take it in to get maintenance. So I just drive it until it breaks down. Or I don't have time to stop and get gas. I'm in too big of a hurry. So you run out of gas. And at some point, in the short run, you save a little time. In the long run, you make your life hell, right? And I think we can easily do that. We can, can ruin our health. We can ruin our relationships, OK? How about uh, uh, spending time with your kids, if you happen to have children? Is that something that has to be done this week? No, it doesn't have to be done this week, does it? If you don't do something with them this week, will it wait till next week? Yeah, it will. How about if you don't do it next week, will it wait till the following week? You know, you can kick that can down the road a little bit, but there are a bunch of things that are quadrant twos that then you find out, okay, now my kid's on drugs, or he has problems, or he's flunking out of school. Why? Because what was a quadrant two activity that I didn't give attention to becomes a quadrant one crisis. 
And I think the goal here is to say, you know, I want to learn to live out my life in such a way that I'm going to learn to put first things first. It's as simple as that. Now, would you agree this is just common sense? Okay, would you agree it's not common practice? Since all of you confessed except one that you don't do weekly planning on Sunday nights, in which case a lot of your quadrant one addicts and you probably almost are dysfunctional until you get, if there's not a deadline, I've had faculty tell me, I can't do this until there's a deadline. It's like, that's my sort of adrenaline rush, right? And if without my adrenaline rush, I'm just incapacitated, and I'm saying, well, your adrenal gland's going to one day die, and you better sort of figure out a different way to motivate yourself besides deadlines. So part of the goal here, then, is to say that's what I need to do. Now, <coughs> a lot of these things, quadrant of deception, a uh, friend of mine uh, who made this slide up call, says many service activities fall into this quadrant. Let me simply say that doing departmental service is actually something we should all do our fair share. Uh, but our fair share would be, if there's 20 people in my department, then I should do no more than how much? 5%, right? Yeah, you can do the math. 1 over 20 is 0.05, which is 5%. So I want to be a good citizen, but as an assistant professor, your department should not be asking you to do a lot of time-consuming service things. Now, because you're an assistant professor, if they ask you to do something, your inclination is to say what? Yes, yes sir. Yes, ma'am. Whatever. But hopefully you have some sort of a mentor, an advocate, who is a senior professor who is helping you. Uh, and I think you need to try as hard as possible to minimize the amount of things that you do as service because they are things that have some value to the department, but they're things that should be done by the more senior faculty. And sometimes we're too eager when we're working on tenure to try to look like we're a good team player and we volunteer for a lot of stuff and so forth. And what I'm saying is, don't do that, okay? When it comes to getting tenured, how much does service count? Well, I wouldn't say it counts zero, but it, it doesn't count a bunch, okay? If you think it counts a bunch, you should go talk to your department head and just clarify that. Because I do think it's important that you show you're willing to be a good citizen in the department, but do as little as you can to accomplish that. It isn't the most important thing that you're doing right now, for sure. And again, I would put email in here. There's lots of things that you can do that have the appearance of importance, but they're mostly things that come to you, not things that you take initiative towards. I'm responding to my environment, whether it's phone calls or emails or whatever, and I can, I can waste a huge amount of time not by carefully planning, by not carefully planning, and by simply doing what? I'm like an amoeba, and I go through the week by responding to all the different things that push on me, and maybe there are all kinds of random things that are important to other people, but they're not things that are necessarily important to what I'm doing, and they're things I probably shouldn't even be getting involved in, and so I need to learn to stay focused like a laser on the things that are the highly important things I need to be doing. And do a little bit of service and try to help out as you can, but don't be a goody-goody two-shoes and think you're going to somehow endear yourself to everybody in your department by being the sort of most service-oriented person in your department. Wait until you're 55 years old and uh, you can become the service star, maybe, but don't do it at this point. Okay. Quadrant four, the quadrant of waste. What would this be? Can you get them? Give me some examples of things that are they're neither urgent nor are they important. Do you ever end up sit, finding yourself sitting on the sofa late at night watching mindless television just because you're sort of brain dead and numb and you're too tired to get up off the sofa and go to bed? Now my wife's laughing because we sometimes do this, don't we? We sit in there and then it's, and it's 11.30 and I say, why did we do that? What we watched was ridiculous and stupid and waste of time, uh, but I was just sort of, you know, goofing off, I guess. And I think there are better ways to goof off. Now, I'm not against watching television, but if you choose your programs carefully and, and maybe do it together so that you're sharing some time together, uh, uh, or in my case, maybe watching sporting events with friends, there are certain things. Uh, what would you consider, for example, if you happen to like OSU uh, basketball or football, uh, going to a sporting event with uh, friends? Would, which quadrant would that be? Well, it depends on, in your 
goals that we talked about in uh, uh, begin with the end in mind. If your goal is to have no friends, okay, then going to the football game with people is a quadrant four. But if your goal is to have friends and relationships are important to you, then I would say the right kind of socializing activities are actually quadrant two, aren't they? If you don't get to go this week, you can probably go next week. So it's not that often that it's urgent, but it is important. And again, this is the kind of balance that we want to get into our lives. Uh, how about going, if you're married, how about going out on a date with your spouse? You know? A lot of graduate students sort of suspend social life, but you can't do that for five years, right? It's like having a plant that you don't water. I have a next door neighbor who gives me a little pot plant almost every year and puts it by the side of my garage door because he knows I'm not a very good gardener. And that, I've killed about 10 of them because it would only take a little bit of watering once in a while, but I don't do that and then only a little bit of nurturing and it would be fine. We have a little atrium inside of our house and half the plants have brown leaves on them and I always feel bad, but I don't do anything about it, you know? And uh, so my point is when you think of quadrant two, don't just think of professional advancement. Think of holistic, uh, living a balanced life where your children are important. If you have children, your spouse is important. Having a circle of friends is important. Don't abandon all of that to get tenure. It's not worth it. When I first worked on tenure, I thought if I have to mortgage everything that's important in my life to be tenured, I have the wrong job. And I'll go do something else. I'll work at a different university. I'll say, uh, screw universities. I'll go get a job in industry. I'll do something else. So. Okay, that's my suggestion. I think this is something that's extremely important, though, as you begin to think through the different things that are sucking up your time. Here's a good project for you for next week. Keep a time log for the whole week, kind of one hour at a time. So you can just make yourself out a little simple schedule, and you'll have, uh, let's say, from whenever you get up in the morning, 7 in the morning until 11 at night or whatever uh, time you stay up. Uh, I recommend at least eight hours of sleep unless you think you're superhuman. And most people do, and they're not. Uh, but keep a time log. And don't make any special effort to do anything different. It would be interesting to see what you're really doing now as a starting point, wouldn't it? So you, you log that time, and then when you finish logging, at the end of the week, you go back and you put all of the different things. How many hours did you spend in quadrant one? How many, time how many hours did you spend in quadrant two? How many hours did you spend in quadrant three and in quadrant four? Okay. Now that will really be an interesting exercise for you because it'll kind of tell you where you're at right now and hopefully maybe it'll motivate you to uh, begin to develop, the, to do the things you need to do to develop habits. What's the key way to live more in quadrant two? <coughs> what's the key here? I already told you. What's the key? Weekly planning. Trust me, if you don't have a compass to get through the week, you're going to be blown this way and that way, and you think you're going to be headed toward you know, Cancun and you're going to end up in uh, Haiti or someplace not as uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, desirable for your vacation trip is what you had in mind. Okay, so I think that the goal here, okay, the goal here is the bigger numbers. The actual practice for most people is the smaller numbers. And what this says is that the goal is to spend, what, 65 to 80% of my time in quadrant two. Now, why not 100? Because I think 100 is totally unrealistic. There are things that come up that have short deadlines. And you have to do something. So every life has some serendipity. And the serendipity has to be, be dealt with, right? Okay. But, man, if I could be living 80% of my time here and only 20% here, you could get off your blood pressure medicine, okay? <laughs> or whatever other sort of stress-induced uh, issues that you have. And it's interesting, we live in a culture today. I thought when I was growing up, they said, with technology, life is going to get easier and easier and easier. And it didn't work out that way, did it? When I first got my first desktop computer, I had a really friend who's smarter than I am, and I said, this is great. I'll be able to get twice as much work done. And he said, why would you do that? Why not get 
the same amount of work done in half the time. And I thought, wow, isn't that a different way of looking at things? And that's part of our problem, isn't it? The more work-saving devices we get, do we actually allow it to allow us to relax more? No, we simply do more and more and more work and go faster and faster and faster. And every time we are blessed with some new labor-saving device, we just add extra activity into our life so that we go faster and faster and faster. And it really is stressful. Uh, I just retired last May. I didn't retire because of the work. You know, I retired because I'm tired of 45 years of deadlines. And I'm tired of deadlines even. I've, I've moved a lot of things over so that if I get a lot of things over here, then the deadlines aren't a problem anymore. But I'll have to say, I don't always do this well. Before I came to OSU, I did something really important. I turned in my 2011 income tax. <laughs> now, that was supposed to be done when? April 15th. But for those who are in quadrant one and didn't quite get it done, then you can they give you a break and you can do it October 15th. Now, what did I do? Well, I did it the night before we came. I stayed up till 3 a.m. and we mailed it as we went out of town. And so I have to say that there, you know, I hate doing income tax. I mean, there are some things I always do in quadrant one because I can't stand to do it. But that's a cop out. And so I'm still learning. I've been working on this for a long time. It's, it's fun to teach it. Then I, it reminds me of all the things I need to do better at doing. But at least having it in mind is good. And I don't procrastinate on everything. But most of us procrastinate on what? The things we don't like to do. What's the hardest thing to do when you're writing a paper or proposal? It's to write the first page, right? You ever have writer's cramps? You can't even get to it. You just, and if you think, I'm going to write down something, I don't care how terrible it is. I just want to have something down. I've got to get started. The getting started is the hard part in trying to get past uh, some of these problems. Okay. Okay, we've got a great illustration here, and uh, I want to ask somebody to come up and volunteer who also has children, and I'll explain the illustration. So do we have somebody who's working on tenure and also has children? We got any volunteers here? Good. Come on up. Tell us your name. Francisco. Francisco, okay. Thank you for volunteering. I didn't want to have to conscript some unwilling person. Now, we're going to do this illustration. And the illust this, these things, we're going to use some rocks. And this is actually a Stephen Covey illustration. I didn't come up with this, but it, it's a great illustration. The rocks represent the important things that must be done this week in my schedule. Okay? And the size of the rock is a measure of what? The amount of time it's going to take. This container represents my whole week on Sunday when all of the time is still there to be spent, right? So the idea then is going to be uh, to try to figure out how to get through this week and be sure that each of these things get done. Now, Francisco, why don't you look and tell me what are the things this coming week that you need to get done? It's Sunday, and you're looking at these things, and, and some rocks are bigger and some are smaller, but these are all things that are important. So they're either quadrant one or quadrant two kinds of activities, okay? So what are the things that you need to do this week according to, to the rocks that I've prepared there for you? Well, you need to get the journal article revision submitted. Okay, and they've said if you don't get it in this week, then we're not going to publish it. So that is a very big and very hard rock. Okay, what else? Exercise. Okay. Now that's an easy one to put off, isn't it? Exercise, I don't have time for exercise. I'm in quadrant one. Exercise is quadrant two. Okay, what else? Um, now let's oh, leave, let's leave, leave, leave him out okay, for a second. Okay. Yeah, we're going to leave him out here for a minute. Okay. okay. Yeah. Right now, just tell us what, what else you have coming this week. This is all the stuff, and we're going to then figure out how you're going to get through the week. Uh, I have to go for okay. That's, that's kind of an every week thing, isn't it? I mean, sometimes maybe you've taught the course before and you just need to brush up a little bit. Okay, what else? The important things for this week. It's all the important things for this week. 
Okay, so what's this one here? Uh, great exams to return, but not okay. my, my, my students get upset if I don't return my exams, okay? Okay. What's that? Finished research proposal. Okay. Now, let's suppose it's Sunday night, but Francisco hasn't yet begun to apply the things he's learning in this class. So he has these all in mind, right? But he has not really put a place for them in his coming week. Okay, now on Monday, uh, he has uh, a bunch of emails. And uh, do y'all ever start out doing emails as your first thing every day? Why do we do that? Because we don't want to do real work, right? <laughs> I mean, you start out doing emails, and then you say, and my desk is messy, so I should clean up my desk. Why? Well, that's easier than doing real work. And we do, we do the tasks that are easiest now. A lot of the easiest tasks are also the ones that are not important. And we put off doing the ones that are really important. You do that? Okay. So on Monday, like many professors, he's going to get all caught up on his email, all 400 of them. And so he spends Monday uh, not doing any of his big rocks. Why? Because he still has a whole week to get it done. Okay. Okay, so there, let's put in, and this is what we're going to call the, the sort of daily gravel of the average college professor. These are little rocks, and the little rocks are, are in this category of things that are not that important. They're not zero value, but they're not very important, okay? Now, Tuesday comes along, and he has uh, some of his colleagues ask him to do some favors for them uh, that uh, are really nice things that he could do to help. Uh, and he's working on tenure, and maybe some of the people that ask are tenured, and he feels sort of obliged to, to well, gosh, if they ask me to do this, maybe I better do it, and so forth. And uh, well, Maybe they are members of the RPT committee. All, maybe all the more reason <laughs> that some of these things probably need to get done. And then somebody asks him if they, he can help do some service thing for the department. They're setting up some kind of a, a, a program for the students for late in the afternoon, kind of social thing. And being untenured, he feels like, gosh, I need to help do that. Okay, so... His Tuesday ends up looking something like this, okay? Okay, so now we're basically to Wednesday, and all of a sudden he, he realizes he's got all these things with all these deadlines. He already gave some bad lectures on Monday because he didn't get them prepared, and he wants to make, make that up on Wednesday by being really prepared. So now your job is to sort of see if you can work out your week to be successful by putting uh, your rocks in your uh, schedule, okay? Uh, for Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, because this is Monday and Tuesday, and they're gone, okay? So this is Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and you got done all the little unimportant things that were kind of easy and the things we kind of gravitate to, okay? So your job is to, to try to see if you can fit in these big rocks into your, to your main part of your week, yeah. Yeah, use, use spatial visualization. It's going to be tricky to get all these guys in there. Okay, now. Ah. Uh, now, now, they can't go over the top. That, you're, the, the week only goes to here, okay? That's the amount of time you have to work with. So, uh, so what are you going to do? <laughs> well, you're going to have to leave some things out, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, what else did you have in here? Let's see. You had attend a son's football game. Okay, I'm glad you put that one in. Which ones did you decide to leave off? Grading the exams. Do you think you can put the students off for one more week? <laughs> Now, they'll all whine and complain. Do y'all students do that? They are all like they're in, they're, they have very low expectations for themselves with regard to how they do work, but they have very high expectations for the kind of uh, performance they want from the faculty, right? Okay. And how about this one? Is that one you can leave out, or maybe you can trade it for something else? Well, the Finish research proposal. That's pretty important. If you're working on tenure, and the deadline's this Friday. Yeah, but you cannot do anything. Well, you could trade. I mean, you can, you can screw up some other deadlines. Okay, don't go to your son's football game this week. He'll be playing next week. That's maybe a possibility. Well, let's do this. No, yes. <laughs> I think your week's a mess. <laughs> no, I don't think it's going to work. Okay, now, that's on Wednesday. And suppose we had a time machine and we could sort of run the week backwards to Sunday again and start over Okay, so let's do that. Okay, unfortunately, you can't do this in real life. Okay, you can't say, well, it's Wednesday and I've screwed up my week. Okay, now let's try. We're going to start over on Sunday and we're going to put our big rocks into our 
uh, life for this coming week, and let's see how that works. Okay, okay. So put some of those big ones in and important ones in. Okay. Okay. A little bit of push and shove now. Cool. Now let's do this. Let's see if we can put this in. Okay. Why don't you pour this in and, do, and, and, and kind of shake it and let's see what happens. Okay, we're doing pretty good, aren't we? Okay, way to go. Keep going. Okay. Huh? Okay. <laughs> and actually, we could get, with a little bit more messing with it, we can get the rest of this in. Okay, give Francisco a hand, okay? <laughs> now, what does this application mean? What's the take home on it? Okay. When do you do your weekly planning? On Sundays. If you put your big rocks in your schedule on Sunday, then you can put in as much gravel around that as you want. And we all have plenty of gravel. If I'm not careful, my whole life ends up being gravel, right? And I don't get any big important things done because I'm too busy doing the easy things, the things that are kind of not very challenging, you know, and like doing email and looking at other goofy things that come in on email that are just distractions, you know. Uh, 97 things about the election or uh, everybody's opinions about stuff. that I don't even know who the people are. I don't even know what the thing's about. And you can just fritter away lots of time. Okay, so the goal here is to say what, what the, probably the first and most important discipline, if you're going to really learn to put first things first, the way to actualize that is what? Learn to practice planning on Sunday, or preferably even Friday. Now, here's the second thing. How do you decide what your big rocks are, though? Okay? How do you decide what your big rocks are? Remember what we said habit two was? Begin with the end in mind. And if you do habit two carefully, you will define for yourself, not just professionally, but more broadly, what are those important things that are going to be your big rocks. Okay? And if you can identify what those are, then when you begin to do your weekly planning every week, if I look at what I would potentially like to do, guess what? I always have more things that I could and need to do than time. Now I can decide what's not going to get done this week. How do we sometimes decide that? We just go plowing down the week and whatever gets done doesn't get done. And some of the really important things didn't get done and a lot of silly things got done. So the only way to be sure you're going to put first things first is to do what? Plan exactly how you're going to do that on Sunday. And if some things are going to get done and some aren't, I'd like to consciously decide that in advance, not decide it by accident, by doing what's easy first, saving the hard, challenging things for later, and having those not get done. Okay? So I think this is basically the scheme. Okay. Now we've got 10 more minutes. Let me share with you a couple of uh, uh, other things that uh, I think you'll find helpful. Habit four, think win-win. Uh, fixed versus variable pie size. If you believe that the pie is fixed in size, then this will affect your willingness to collaborate. And let me share with you a real simple example. I had an idea for something I wanted to do at Texas A&M. I was going to send in an NSF proposal. The request for proposals said that the normal award size would be $250,000 for three years. This was maybe 20 years ago. Today, it's probably more. And so I needed to use some equipment that was in chemical engineering. I'm in mechanical engineering. Now, I didn't really want a collaborator. I just wanted access to the equipment. I didn't think I needed a collaborator. Why? Because I thought, if, it's, if I'm going to get $250,000, I want all of it. And I'm not looking for somebody to share it with, particularly when I just want to use the guy's stupid piece of equipment. 
So I go over to talk to him and I explain to him, I'm trying to do a proposal, I need to use your electric discharge machining equipment and uh, uh, could I use that? And, and, and he didn't say, well, why don't you put me on as the co-principal investigator? But, and if I'd been looking into his eyes more carefully, I would have seen that. And he said, okay, uh, well, if that's what you want to do, uh, you can use it, but the use fees are $75 an hour. And I thought, $75 an hour? My gosh, I can buy commercial time in Houston for $25 an hour, but then I have to drive to Houston. And so I thought about that, and I told him that sounded really unreasonable. And he said, well, the equipment's expensive, and it breaks down, and it has lots of use, you know, blah, 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 blah. And I had thought about going to talk to the dean because I felt like the, the college had purchased this equipment for his lab, but he hadn't bought it with research money. It was purchased by the university, and it should have been something we could all use, right? And I thought about it. And I said, you know, I can go in and make a case and really get this guy shafted, you know, and then force him to let me use his equipment. Now, that probably wouldn't work because he would also know how to sabotage it, right? So he can say, well, sure, you can use it. And then he's always pulling a plug on something or unwiring it, and it would never work for me. So I decided maybe this was not a fruitful approach. And so I finally went back over and I said, look, I've been thinking about it. Maybe we should, would you be interested in being a co-principal investigator with me? He said, gosh, I really would be interested in doing that. And so then we got to talking about the proposal and we wrote it. And I asked him, okay, and, and we need to put in something for use fees for the equipment. Ah, oh, never breaks down. It's no problem. I think he forgot what he <laughs> told me. That's not an issue at all, you know. And, uh, uh, and then we put the budget up. I said, okay, my part was like two-thirds. His part would be one-third. So we jacked the budget up to $375,000 instead of two fifty, dollars and just sort of crossed our fingers and said, let's see what happens. And lo and behold, we got it funded by NSF. And it was the only project I ever had funded where they didn't come and try to nickel and dime me down and say, we're going to fund it, but we don't have quite that much money. The usual, if you work in engineering and science, they always say, we're going to fund it, but they're always trying to sort of uh, chisel you back some. They just said, 375 is fine and uh, no problem. And, and I was really embarrassed because, you know, this is like I've been, after I've been teaching some of this stuff for five or ten years and, and begin with the, uh, or excuse me, uh, uh, thank win-win is basically what this was, wasn't it? I was assuming the pie's a fixed size, and if we do a co-proposal, uh, then I've got to give up part of my size of the fixed pie instead of recognizing maybe the pie could be bigger if we did the project together. Now, Habit 5 says, seek first to understand, then to be understood. And once I figured out what was really the problem here, then I was able to sort of uh, change. It turned out not only did we need his equipment, he had some insights about what we were doing. It was a material science project, but we were evaluating it based on spark uh, discharge spark erosion discharge machining resistance. And his being involved in the project actually helped it to be much more successful. We actually got patents out of it and sold them to a company. It was one of the best and most successful projects I ever had. And I almost didn't get to do it. Why? Because I was not thinking win-win. Now, to be successful in academia, I think in most cases, I can't speak for every different area, but I can certainly tell you in science and engineering, being able to work collaboratively with other people will make you much more productive than being a lone ranger. Today's world, the things that we're working on, the problems are often complex enough that no one person kind of can cover the whole breadth of things that maybe are necessary to address that problem. And so, remember this, the ha second habit has to do with what? The public victory as opposed to the private victory. And that really is learning to work in the best possible way with other people and learning to develop clear win-win kinds of agreements. And one of the things to understand is that win-win, uh, the sixth habit, is it's not really a win-win unless there's synergism. And synergism means what? The sum is greater, uh, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Why did our working together work out? Because what we could accomplish together was much more than what I could have accomplished by myself or what he could accomplish by himself. And there are many situations that are like that. If you can't come up with a good win-win agreement, then it probably means it should be no deal. It's not that collaboration is always useful. There are times when it really isn't. If I worked with somebody who had exactly my background, then there's no synergism. We're just redundant, one of us is. 
So look for the right kinds of opportunities to collaborate. Find people that have complementary uh, skills and uh, knowledge base and so forth to what you're doing. But learn to work productively with other people. Now, I hope at OSU they actually encourage that and allow you to get credit. Uh, some schools don't always encourage that as they should. I've been to MIT a number of times, and what I found there that was surprising is they don't give any credit for collaborating with other people in their department. And guess what? Nobody collaborates. So I went to visit a guy at MIT who invited me to come up. He was doing polymeric composite materials work. There's another guy who is uh, pretty equally uh, well-known as, as this guy and myself. And I asked him, did they ever work together? And he hardly even knew the guy. He was his competitor. He was not his collaborator. I hope you don't have that kind of an environment at OSU because it's really very counterproductive and I think pretty stupid. So look, at, look for opportunities at school or in other schools as you go to conferences. In today's world with all of the communications and, and relatively inexpensive travel, it's easy to work with people from other places. And a lot of times some of your most productive work comes by developing partnerships that you develop with people you meet at conferences or so forth and so on that help you to do things you couldn't do by yourself and help them to do something that they couldn't do by themselves. Okay, one last thing and then we shall quit. I said earlier, okay, that as a department head, I had 67 faculty. I carefully evaluated them every year and I found that the people who worked hardest or the people who were smartest weren't necessarily the ones who were most successful. Here's the key. Choice of a research area is extremely important. You can be very smart, but you're working in an area that is already worked over. It's like going into an orchard. If you've, nobody's been there before, there's lots of low-hanging fruit. I want to be the first one in the new orchard. I don't want to be the last one in the old orchard. When you're the last one in the old orchard, where's all the residual fruit? It's up in the top of the tree and it's difficult to get it. There ain't much of it left. So I want to be first into the new orchard, not the last one still hanging on in the old area. And I saw so many faculty that were unwilling to change their areas, and so they didn't do very well. Think of research as gold mining, okay? The most important step in being successful in research is the selection of the problem to be studied. What I did for my PhD dissertation is what my dissertation chair told me to do. But it was not something I felt like was sort of more broadly useful. I did have funding from the Air Force and I was, I was well paid doing the work. But I didn't think it was a good future. So one of our temptations is to take our dissertation topic and do what? Try to make a career out of doing that. Depending on what the topic is, that might be successful. But if it's an area that's mature, a lot of work's been done, there's not many new things to do except dot I's and cross T's, maybe I need to look harder and find other things to get involved in as well. If you're mining a tapped out mine with great skill and diligence, guess what? You will still not get much gold. Why? Because there isn't gold left. And I don't care how diligent you are or how smart you are, if there's no gold in the mine left, then there's no gold in the mine left. And it's time to move on. Now, at some point in your career, you're going to have to do this. I think a lot of you are probably trying to milk your dissertation for as long as you can, but be, be sure that doesn't go on forever. And for some of you, it may already be past the time of greatest opportunity. Give very careful thought to problems that are significant in your profession, and if possible, uh, for me as a Christian, ones that uh, are significant in helping people in the broader sense of the world, not just uh, uh, getting another uh, paper. Okay, so you can talk to colleagues to find better gold mine topics, visit potential coll with collaborators and sponsors, uh, become a very good listener. A lot of times when we talk to people about research, we do what? We do all of the talking. I learn a lot more when I'm listening, and I learn almost nothing when I'm talking. Sometimes I'm in the sales mode. I have a son-in-law who's a very, very good salesman, and he's kind of an introvert. And I said, David, how come you're such a good salesman and you're an introvert? And he says, because I'm a good listener. And he said, the best way to sell is to do what? Listen to people and find out what they really want. Listen to potential research sponsors. Sometimes I'm so busy trying to tell them what I'm doing and how great it is that I'm not listening for what it is that they're really interested in. Read broadly. OK? 
I attend national meetings. I like to focus on uh, smaller meetings, especially because I get more opportunity to meet people and to have meals together and so forth uh, and meet people. Be entrepreneurial. Entrepreneurship is really based on opportunity recognition. Now, we think of that in the business world, but I think most of us, in one way or the other, are sort of entrepreneurs in our area, aren't we? I told my people in mechanical engineering, we're like a mall, and we have 67 shops. Each of you runs one of those shops, and if we all work together, we, the mall will be more successful and we'll be individually more successful, but at the end of the day, each shop has to be successful in some sense based on its own opportunity or its own ability to recognize uh, opportunities and so forth. And then for me, I like to, I pray, I ask God help me, guide me to things that are really new and interesting and something that'll be helpful, that'll be important. Uh, I, I like to think of making an impact, not just getting a publication. Are there areas I can work in that could make a bigger difference in well-being of uh, people in our country and the well-being of people in developing countries and so forth? Uh, so, let's see. I think we are out of time and I should be out of PowerPoint. Oh, one more thing. Why publish or perish? Now, I want to emphasize no matter how much you publish, you're going to perish. Okay? So in some sense, this is sort of a oxymoron. Because you can't publish enough to not perish. It's going to happen sooner or later. So, and you can't write enough papers to put it off. Okay? But having said that, uh, why publish or perish? I think the cynical view is it's a game that academics play without any practical significance. And there are, I think sometimes it can be like that, can it? A lot of times there's so much literature out there and it's just people writing junk because they have to have so many publications to get promoted and so forth and so on. Okay, I think there's a stewardship view of, of publisher Paris that says if research is paid for by the public, as much of it is, and your research is being paid because your school is giving you a reduced teaching load, is that right? If you're at a community college, you might teach four courses a semester. If at OSU you're teaching two or maybe three, then they're paying somebody's paying for the time you're putting in to do research. Even if you don't have external funded research, the school's grant gift of time is a payment. And so I feel like that, that I have a responsibility to make available what I've learned to the public at large by publishing in archival journals. And I also like to think that God gives us, if God gives me significant insights in my research that are to be shared with other people to make their lives better and their appreciation of God and his goodness greater, then I want to be choosing topics that I think will help people, will help our country, will help people in developing countries. So I don't want to just do kind of any research. If I can think of things that are more strategic in making a difference, then that's what I would ultimately like to be doing, okay? So, when I'm doing research where I think it can make a difference right now, the biggest thing I'm working on is using coconut shell and coconut fiber to make automotive composites for Ford Motor Company and other companies because it's going to help 11 million coconut farmers increase their income by 50%. Now, to me, that's very motivational. Can I write papers on this? The answer is, of course. Most of my career, I did high-performance composites for the Air Force and NASA. But to me, this is much more exciting because it's going to make a big difference in the lives of the people that we're working with. We already have a production facility in Indonesia. We've started a company. We have another one in the Dominican Republic. And it's some of the most exciting stuff I've ever done. As you think of your own area, whether it's education or whether it has to do with sociology or with literature or whatever, I think all of us have the gift of, of time to be able to do something that makes a difference, right, uh, in the lives of other people. And I would hope that... Uh, that you would see that as a special opportunity to give back in some particular way beyond just achieving tenure. If your goal is to make a difference, you will almost surely do things that are significant, and if you do things that are significant, you will almost surely get tenure. Okay? And beyond tenure, you don't want to just spend 30 years of writing papers that nobody reads and maybe not doing anything that's important. At the end of the day, you'd like to say, not only did I do some research, but it actually made a difference. Okay, we are out of time. I've gone three minutes over by my watch. I apologize, uh, but uh, thank you for your time and attention, and I hope uh, the things that I've shared are
some ideas that will be helpful to you uh, in uh, trying to go through this tenure process and, uh, and having the best possible experience along the way. Okay? We will send out the PowerPoints uh, by email if you've signed up. Okay? Thank you again. It's great to be here.